come to the seminar today. Um, and today's speaker is Sean Balachi. Sean will be is a student or currently a PhD student at the University of Sydney and is will be graduating kind of beginning of next year. And he's currently uh, so he has been working on uh, phenomenology but also experimental physics. So he did some atlas, he has been working on atlas on Higgs physics and on the phenomenology side he has been working on uh, B physics anomalies and then also here that um, on dark matter and on probing CT violation in fermion transition dipole moments. So he had a couple of papers on that, uh, on those fermion transition dipole moments and CT violation in them. Um, so today he will be talking exactly about that topic and I'm looking forward to your talk, John. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so as Mikhail said, um, uh, my name's Sham, I'm from University of Sydney and um, uh, I'll be talking about CP violation in the fermion transition dipole moment. So just a quick overview. Um, uh, I'll be talking roughly about three papers uh, that I've worked on recently. The first two are on the radiative decay of neutrinos and the neutrino transition dipole moment. And uh, these were done in conjunction with Yiling Zhu from uh, University of Southampton uh, and Maura Kazada, uh, who's connected as well today. She's from Institute uh, of Partic for Particle Physics Phenomenology in Durham. And uh, the last one is a paper I wrote, which is sort of building on the technologies uh, that I showed in section two and three um, for, applied to, uh, for uh, applied to the top quark rather than neutrinos. So I'll start off with an introduction quickly and then I'll move on to these topics and then wrap it up with a conclusion and we can um, ask questions, have some time for questions. So just a quick introduction. So uh, the standard model, uh, as we know, is of particle physics describes three of the four known fundamental forces in nature. So we have uh, the weak force, which dictates um, uh, processes that happens in the sun, for example, radioactive decay, these kinds of things. Electromagnetism, which is mediated by the photon. Um, and then the strong nuclear force, which is responsible for binding nuclei together uh, and all the chemi chemical elements that we see in the periodic table, which is via the gluon. And in the outer ring of this diagram, we see all the fermions that we know of in the standard model. So it does a, a very nice job of um, classifying all the known elementary particles. And it does very wonderful things, makes remarkably, pre remarkably precise predictions. Uh, however, it leaves some important, very important questions unanswered. So the most important uh, so, so of these questions I've kind of shown in this slide here. So these include, what is dark matter? So there's a lot of evidence to suggest that there is either very weakly coupled or completely decoupled matter in the universe. Uh, and the reason we believe this obviously is because if you include additional matter content in the form of dark matter, then you get better fits to experiment when it comes to the CMB power, se power spectrum, when it comes to bullet uh, the, the rotation curves of galaxies, uh, when it comes to bullet clusters, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it exists this kind of inert dark matter. The next question is, what's dark energy? Which is, there's some kind of pressure that's pushing the expansion of the universe from after the Big Bang, and this is accelerating. Uh, so what is that, pro why does that happen? What is this vacuum energy that's causing this process? Uh, we call it dark energy, but this is also a sort of question that doesn't fit into the standard model as we know it. And then why is there more matter than antimatter? So you see the seesaw here. We have way more matter than antimatter but there's no reason a priori that we'd expect this sort of asymmetry. So the mechanisms that cause these, cause this are also very important and uh, unanswered as of now. Also, uh, how does gravity fit in? We don't, the gravity, gravity is not included in the standard model as we currently have it. So there's a fourth force that needs uh, explanation. And where do neutrinos, which are sort of the ghosts of the standard model, uh, particles that are electrically neutral as far as we know, and uh, very hard to detect, they're extremely light, but they have non-zero mass. So why is that? That's also an important question. So we know that um, neutrinos have very small but non-zero mass. Uh, and this is because we've observed lepton flavor mixing in various neutrino oscillation experiments. There are, however, some fundamental questions about neutrinos that we don't know. Uh, for example, what are the electromagnetic properties? I mean, we think they're electrically neutral for now. They could have very small electric charge, but as far as we know, they're electrically neutral. Uh, what are their CP properties? Uh, I'll get into what CP is a little bit later, but CP, broadly speaking, 
um, is a kind of symmetry, a discrete symmetry in the standard model. And um, whether they are Dirac or Majorana fermions. So all the fermions in the standard model are Dirac fermions, as far as we know. Um, and Dirac fermions are fermions where antiparticles are distinct particles to the particle counterpart. So for example, electrons have positrons as a antiparticle, and these are uh, qualitatively different than electrons. However, if you're, if you have, if you're thinking, if you look at a, a, a singlet in a standard model, it can be such that uh, the particle is its own antiparticle. And this, this class of fermions is called, uh, are called Majorana fermions. So um, that's also, uh, if you have additional species of neutrinos, they can be Majorana particles. And this is also a sort of important uh, active area of research. So the main motivation for introducing heavy neutrinos is that they can generate these light non-zero active neutrino masses via the seesaw mechanism, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. But this is sort of the major theoretical motivation amongst other things. And that's what I just said. So the most common one is uh, the seesaw mechanism, which was um, introduced by Fugita and Yanagida many years ago. And the way it works is you introduce these heavy right-handed singlet neutrinos and they can generate these non-zero but uh, non-zero but very light masses for active neutrinos uh, via mixing with them. So the, the when I say active neutrinos, I mean the left-handed neutrinos that we observe in nature. And by doing this, uh, so with this very small mixing, it induces this kind of mass for the active neutrinos. But it also has a very powerful feature, which which is that it can in, induce a mechanism called leptogenesis, which is a good, which is a, provides an explanation for why we have more matter than antimatter, at least in the lepton sector, because these heavy right-handed neutrinos, they can decay, and they decay dom dominantly into uh, matter part, uh, into leptons rather than antileptons. And this uh, provides a sort of natural explanation for why we have this matter antimatter symmetry uh, in nature, for leptons at least. And yeah, so it was originally proposed to address the sub-EV lepton, left-handed neutrino masses, but it also has the, the feature that it can explain the uh, um, uh, matter-antimatter symmetry in the lepton sector. However, if you introduce these um, heavy neutrinos, they do have to be very heavy in order to give you very light active neutrinos. They decay very quickly. So uh, they, dec they decay via weak interactions and they, these decay channels have very large width because of the very high mass of the neutrinos, these heavy right-hand neutrinos. So there are other phenomenological motivations for heavy neutrinos. So it doesn't have to be at seesaw scale. They don't have to be extremely heavy. For example, there are interpretations of sterile neutrinos as dark matter for, uh, that can explain the 3.5 kV X-ray line, um, which is from the Perseus cluster. Very heavy dark matter as well. Uh, so there are, sort of, there are some anomalous events in Ice Cube and uh, a lot of theorists have used he very heavy dark matter as a, a sterile neutrino dark matter as an explanation for these. And the key point here is that when you have these heavy uh, sterile neutrinos, the radiative decays can be more significant than those of active neutrinos because of their large mass. So there's more phase space available. And therefore this kind of channel of radiative decay is a, a major channel of importance when it comes to detecting possible sterile neutrino dark matter. So that's sort of what uh, the majority of my talk is gonna be about. And before I go, before I dive into that, I want to quickly uh, recap everyone on what CP means. So we know at low energy, neutrino oscillations are the best way to clarify the existence of the neutrino sector. And there's been several experiments that have already done this, but and there's going to be new ones like uh, Dune and T2HK, which will uh, observe CP violation and put better bounds on the PMNS matrix, which basically parameterizes the amount of CP violation in the standard model. However, what CP actually means is so we do know that we have left-handed neutrinos in nature because we've observed them. But what you can do is you can do a discrete transformation, which is you can change the charge and the parity. Parity just means that you do a mirror uh, flip in the space-time axis, which will change the chirality of the initial particle. And so, for example, if you have a left-handed neutrino, you do a CP. The CP conjugate is a right-handed antineutrino. Um, and if you just do a P transformation, then you have a right-handed uh, a, a right-handed neutrino, which we have not observed in nature as of now. So there are CP conjugates of left-handed neutrinos, but as of, as far as we know, there are no P conjugates of um, uh, left-handed neutrinos. 
And this is just a sort of schematic of the various um, experiments that I just mentioned. And the most well studied process, at least theoretically, is uh, involving CP violation is the, the decay of these very heavy right handed neutrino neutrinos into standard model leptons and the Higgs boson. And this is because this is the process that sort of uh, is responsible for leptogenesis, which I mentioned earlier. So this is not the process that we'll be studying or talking about much. Uh, the process we're interested in is actually the radiated decay of a heavy neutrino. So this kind of diagram is called the electromagnetic dipole moment of a particle. So many people would be familiar with the muon anomalous dipole moment, uh, where uh, it's a, one of the most precise measurements uh, that's ever been performed in physics or in science in general. And we are trying to find out like uh, that there's a small experiment, there's an experimental tension with the theoretical predictions, which is a similar sort of diagram with uh, the muon. So what we're doing is we're studying the, the dipole moment for the neutrino, of course. Neutrinos in the standard model, they have no electric charge. So this process, it does not happen at tree level. So this is actually an effective vertex here. And that's what we're interested in, this lambda here. So if CP is violated in the neutrino radiated decay, so if you have this decay where you have a heavy neutrino decaying into a lighter decay with a radiation of a photon, then what you end up with is an asymmetry in the polarization of the two processes, of the photons produced in the two processes. And so if you look out into space and you see an asymmetry between these two photons, you can start learning about the properties of the neutrinos because you have an exact formalism to describe what that asymmetry between the two photons being released are. So that's what we're kind of interested in. So th this, is, this moves us onto the, the, the paper. So the formalism in general, we will we, we'll look at a Dirac neutrino decaying, a heavy neutrino decay. So assuming that the, the fermion is a Dirac particle, the amplitude, the scattering amplitude, which is, um, describes the underlying particle physics process in quantum field theory is given by the following equation. And we can see here, we have uh, the polarization vector for the emitted photon. So that just basically characterizes that part. And then you have UPI and UPF. This is just the momenta of the initial and final particles. And uh, these are the spinners, which describe fermions and QFT. And of course, in the middle here, you just have all the interesting physics, which is captured in this effective vertex, which is what we call gamma. And this is called the transition vertex function. And normally, uh, when you're looking at electromagnetic dipole moments, you can separate it into the following. Um, and you have one, two, three, four components. And I'll talk about what each of these mean. Um, this is, goes like gamma mu, which people who've done QFT before will know this, is, looks, this looks like an overall correction to the electric charge of the uh, neutrino. And this is called the anapole um, contribution. And these other two in the middle, these are what we're interested in, which we'll talk about in a second. So for our purposes, we, calc we consider that the electrically charged, that we have electrically uh, we neutral neutrinos. Uh, we require the photon to be on shell in the final state, which means that it's not virtual. And we choose the Lorentz gauge for simplicity. And when you do this, you end up with only two contributions, which are the magnetic and electromagnetic, uh, magnetic and electric dipole moments of the neutrino. And the sigma mu nu, these are tensor terms. The only difference here you can see is there's an axial contribution here for the electric dipole moment. But apart from that, they're the same. So we have these transition dipole moments, uh, electric and magnetic transition dipole moments, and that's what we want to compute for this process. Um, Beyond just uh, computing the amplitude, we need to also, in order to convert this into an observable that we can look for, you need to compute the decay width. And we're interested in the polarized decay width. So we're interested in the neutrino decay and the anti-neutrino decay into the, the respective polarizations of the final, photon, final state photons. And you just have to introduce this phase space factor between the initial mass and the final mass of the neutrinos. And um, you have to just introduce this phase space factor, phase space factor in order to properly compute the decay width. So now we'll talk about the computation of the neutrino transition dipole moment. So in such a process, the key point is that we need to correctly parameterize the, um, the physics inside the vertex function, which I mentioned before. So the operator of interest without going into too much details is just the charge current interaction between charged leptons here and neutrinos here. So this is the neutrinos will have one, two, three, which are the light active neutrinos in the mass eigenstate. But these also go on to capital N, one, two, three, and so on for the heavy neutrinos. And this curly U thing here is just the, the mixing matrix, charge lepton mixing matrix between the neutrinos and all the leptons, including the active neutrinos and the heavy neutrinos that are being introduced. G is just your electric weak coupling constant. So if you do this, there are six possible diagrams you can draw. Uh, realistically, there are only actually two, but 
because of our gauge selection, which we've chosen the Feynman gauge, we have to uh, introduce these additional diagrams. I'll explain what they are in a second. So we have the initial state neutrino and the final state neutrino and the photon in all of the cases. And we have diagrams where you have leptons in the loop and the W. We have two Ws and a lepton in the loop. This L alpha just means that you can have all three charged leptons running in the loop. So you can have electron, muon, and tau. The chi here is just the charged um, component, Goldstone component of the W. And you just need to introduce this in order to compute this in Feynman gauge, which is just more handy than, it's just easier to do it than using unitary gauge. In unitary gauge, you'd only really have these two diagrams. So if we write all the loops out, um, there's a lot of algebra. Uh, basically, we see these U alpha, U alpha star. This is just from the two vertices with the leptons and the neutrinos, either initial or final state neutrinos. Uh, the G squared comes from the two charge current um, coupling vertices. And then we have to integrate over all the internal momenta in, running inside these loops. And then you have all the Dirac algebra and the propagators that run inside the loops. And that's what these are. So for six diagrams, we have six vertex functions we need to compute. And we also have this V thing here, which is for one of the diagrams corresponds to uh, one of the, the gauge boson couplings that we need to introduce. So this is uh, all six loops. Um, what we need to do then is on this, we do dimensional regularization and Feynman parameterization, which is a way of dealing with the, the divergences that appear. So there's the sort of elegant divergence cancellation. And once we've done this process, uh, we can rewrite the vertex function as the following. So you end up with a simplification. This looks like the dipole moment terms we were speaking about before. And we have, instead of Momentum, momentum space, we just have uh, integration over these um, three Feynman parameters and we have P, which corresponds to each loop. So we have to integrate over X, Y, Z, three Feynman, Feynman parameters, and we have all of those contributions. So that's what we get. And these are just denominator terms, which we can write as delta for simplicity. Don't need to go into too much detail there. Um, so one point that might be interesting uh, for some is that we have PL and PR. So there's actually an electro and mag electric and magnetic dipole moment, transition dipole moment component coming from these two. Okay, so after we're doing some algebra and integrating over the Y and Z Feynman parameters, we can rewrite the total sum of all of the contributions from the loops as F. So this is the total kinetic contribution. So it's a dimensionless loop function. This is uh, factorized from all the vertex contributions, which we've, fact uh, we've pulled out the front here. And what we see is that we, we get the following expression and um, we have one more integral left to do, which is over X. So we also define this MF parameter, MFI to the fourth parameter, which is just a dimensionful parameter, mass parameter. Um, this is just done for convenience. Now the key point here, which I'll elaborate on further is when you perform this last integral, you can directly analytically compute the imaginary component of the loop function and of the kinetic term. So there's a bit of algebra, but basically you end up with the following expression where again, we've made this mu squared um, allocation. Uh, the key point here is though that you have these two branches. One of them comes from this theta function when MI is greater than MW plus M alpha, which is the lepton mass. And the other one comes when the final state uh, neutrino is heavier than MW plus M alpha. So if neither of these conditions are satisfied, then you get no imaginary component. And I'll sh uh, we'll, we'll discuss this further, but the, the key point is that you need this imaginary component in order to generate the CP asymmetry, which will cause that polarization asymmetry in the photons that are re uh, released from the decay. So I'll elaborate on this further now. So uh, yeah, so in order to generate the non-zero imaginary part, we need this condition MI uh, to be greater than MW plus M alpha, or we need MF to be greater than MW plus L M alpha. So if you have neutrinos that are lighter than the W mass, for example, you're not going to generate any CP asymmetry in such a process. These, w, th these have to be at least heavier than the, the W mass or the W plus tau mass. And the reason is that, is that if you write these two processes, so we have the neutrino decay and anti-neutrino de decay into the various channels of the photons, uh, CP asymmetries are usually written as this following ratio. So you have delta CP plus and delta CP minus. And on the denominator, you just have the total decay width into photons, either neutrino or anti-neutrino, you don't care which one. But in the, in the numerator, you have the difference between the two processes, whether it's neutrino or anti-neutrino. And after a lot of algebra, basically you can show that this goes like the imaginary part of F. So if the imaginary part of F is zero, then you're not gonna get any CP asymmetry. So it's very important to satisfy those conditions. And 
this these curly J R terms uh, don't need to worry about them too much. But mainly, the, these are just coming from the vertex. So this is coming from the lepton mixing matrices that I mentioned earlier. Uh, these are called Yalskog uh, invariants, and um, they're just a combination of the lepton mixing matrix uh, um, and, uh, phases. And you can see here we need an imaginary part for these as well. So you're not going to get any CP symmetry at loop level if you don't have CP symmetry at tree level. And in the standard model, we do have CP symmetry at tree level with the Dirac phase in the PMNS matrix. So you need two, you need both ingredients in order to get the CP symmetry in this process. So similarly, uh, I showed all that that formalism was for Dirac neutrinos, but you can apply the same for Majorana neutrinos. And um, it uh, simplifies to the following. So in the denominator, because uh, the particle and antiparticle are the same, you just have the following um, in the denominator, so the neutrino decay, and you just have the difference between the polarizations of, uh, of the photons in the top, in the numerator. And if you do the algebra again, you get all these Yogg-Skog parameters, which are vertex, basically vertex functions, and uh, not vertex functions, vertices, from the vertices of the loops, and then these F and F star, so forth. These are just the uh, various, um, uh, loop functions, uh, kinetic terms, and you need to sum over all the imaginary parts of these in order to properly compute the CP symmetry. So uh, that's all well and good. So the formalism has been developed. So what's interesting now is for us to go further and uh, have a look at what the phenomenology would look like. So if these neutrinos existed, what kind of observables would we produce? So that's what I'll uh, do in the following section. Um, so we, we again, we're going we're to consider Majorana uh, neutrinos. We introduce new heavy Majorana, Majorana neutrinos so we can have the seesaw mechanism as we mentioned before. So we generate the light neutrino masses via the seesaw mechanism. And we'll introduce just two uh, right-handed neutrinos. Um, we call them M1, capital M1 and capital M2, with capital M2 greater than capital N1, uh, M1. And this is just a... Um, this is just an arbitrary choice. I mean, we chose the lightest, the smallest number of neutrinos such that we can demonstrate the CP asymmetry. In principle, you can, gen you can introduce as many generations as you want, um, but then you just have more and more free parameters. So when we did this study, um, uh, I'll, we get the following. So I'll explain what this is. So we have the, the CP asymmetry for Majorana, neutri Majorana neutrinos for the heavy neutrino, the heaviest sterile neutrino decaying into the lightest sterile neutrino and the photon. We plot the absolute magnitude of this. And in the top panels, we have the CP symmetry on the left-hand side and the branching ratio on the right-hand side. Both of these are interesting, right? You need to know how often these events will, these decays will occur, and you want to know what the CP symmetry is as well. So we show the, the plots of the CP symmetry and the branching ratio for three cases, where the lighter sterile neutrino is 20% of the mass of the heavy neutrino, 50% and 80% respectively. Uh, that's going from magenta, blue, and cyan respectively. And um, we can see, uh, I'll explain what this omega parameter is in a second, but basically you can see here that we have up to, we can get very large CP asymmetry, up to 10 to the negative two, 10 to the minus three kind of thing. But the branching ratio is extremely tiny here, it's very suppressed, 10 to the minus 17. But if you change this omega parameter, um, if you in introduce a, a, a complex component for it, then you, can, you suppress the CP asymmetry a bit. Now you're around 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus four um, from, M2 going from 100 GV to 10 TV, but you actually enhance the branching ratio a lot. So it's sort of this catch-22 where if you change this phase, you can increase the branching ratio and reduce the CP symmetry or reduce the CP symmetry and increase the branching ratio. So this is, um, this omega parameter here is just, um, it comes from, it basically parameterizes the complex phase for the new Majorana particles. So it's kind of arbitrary. So it's essentially a free parameter. There's no, um, uh, reason we chose five or five minus five i. We just it was just a, a, an arbitrary selection. In in principle, you can have any value, any complex number here. But the restriction is that there are experimental restrictions on these. So we we just chose values which were experimentally not excluded. But just to see what the effect is, we also did a scan. Uh, I should say also that the neutrino mixing angles and all that they're the they're chosen to be the um the three sigma best fits in this uh, in these curves. But what you can do is actually you can scan over them as well. So now we have a red region where we scan the real part of omega going to, from zero to two pi and the, the imaginary part going from five to minus five. You can increase this actually, if, like you can go 10 to minus 10 or something, but then the, there's experimental constraints which cut that off. So this is sort of within experimental bounds. And the, that, that's what the red region is, which is the larger region with the CP symmetry on the left-hand side and the branching ratio on the right-hand side. 
and we allowed the oscillation parameters for the neutrinos um, to from new fit to fluctuate between the three sigma uh, boundaries regions and when we did that we get the following so we can see cp symmetry can get all the way up to percent level like above percent level 20 percent so forth uh, but the largest branching ratio we can see is about sort of 10 to the minus 11 uh, for the process itself for the, this kind of decay channel so another question someone might have is you looked at the cps symmetry for this n2 to n1 gamma channel so this is just between sterile neutrinos what about n1 or n2 to new gamma but when we did this computation which is so new as the active neutrino the issue is that the cps symmetry is extremely tiny 10 to the minus 17 is what we're getting roughly um, you get a much larger branching ratio, which is also interesting, but you don't get a CP uh, sort of um, noteworthy CP symmetry that can be observed. But uh, obviously, when we looked at the sterile neutrino decay channels, you can get up to 10 to the minus 3, uh, even with the Dirac phase being the only source of the, the CP violation. And what this ultimately means is that you get a, if you look into space, you'll see an asymmetry in the number of photons um, with given polarization being uh, generated. And from there, you can you can probe neutrino properties, or the neutrino, the mothers, uh, the, the properties of the neutrinos that they came from. I'm going for time. Okay, so uh, this this process is of course loop suppressed, um, but in, but it is observable in theory. And if you introduce, so right now we've only introduced heavy um, heavy neutrino singlets. But what you can do is actually you can introduce lighter neutrinos, maybe KV neutrinos, for example. And within the standard model, they're not going to produce CP symmetry because they're lighter than the W boson. But you can introduce new um, new particle interactions. So in the first paper, we looked at a Yukawa interaction with um, millicharged scalars and fermions. And in that case, you can get KV neutrinos um, producing CP symmetry. And um, that that can explain, for example, the, um, the xenon one ton anomaly and and these kinds of things. So in that case, you it's it's a bit more you're introducing more new Fourier parameters because you're introducing BSM particles spectrum but the same formalism that we've de developed here can be used for those those models there's also another issue here which is that it's a bit of a challenge to experimentally measure the polarization of high energy photons coming from space so for example if you have you know several like a 10 tv neutrino decaying and you're producing you know uh photons that are north of tv producing polarization like performing polarization measurements on those photons is very difficult you can do those as far as I'm aware, in lab controlled conditions at the moment, but it's quite hard to do that for part of, for photons coming from space. Uh, so yeah, so now I'll be quickly uh, going over the last topic, which is um, the top quark QED and QCD transition dipole moment. Uh, and this is based on the, the archive number shown here. So the, talk, uh, the top quark, um, we produce these dominantly through this channel here where we have in the LHC, we have a proton and a proton, collide them at very high energy and produce TT bar. So particle and antiparticle versions of the top. And the, the dominant decay is the tree level decay into W and B. Uh, uh, so you have a W and a B quark. And the W then decays either leptonically, as you can see here, mu to nu, or the W can also decay hadronically into B and C or other uh, quark jets. However, this isn't the actual, this isn't the only thing the top can decay into. There, there are other channels apart from this dominant tree level decay. And sticking with the theme of what I've been going over so far, uh, we're going to look at the decay of the top into either a C, a, a, another, a charm jet and a gamma, or a charm jet and a gluon. So these are processes that are kind of similar to what we just looked at with the neutrinos. But instead of um, leptons, we're going to be working on the quark sector. And instead of the photon being radiated, we'll also look at the gluon being radiated in the final state. And um, so, this is more or less the same formalism. We have the vertex function here, but instead we have the top quark in the initial state and some sort of uptype quark in the final state. And we have downtype quarks running in the loops. Apart from that, everything else is the same. So if we do, if we crank the handle, do all the loop integrals, um, we do Feynman dimensional regularization, Feynman parameterization, we get the following. So we have the QED transition dipole moment, which I didn't note with gamma, uh, and the QCD transition dipole moment, the kinetic term is given by G. So we have these two terms here. And in both cases, we make this assignment here for M4, which is just for simplicity. And this, of course, we need to integrate one more time to get something useful. And when we do that, we get these imaginary components. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but we, we see that we, we have the same condition where we require that the initial state has to be heavier than the W and the initial state must be heavier than W, which, w, which is 
what motivated me to look at this in the first place because the top quark is the only fermion in the standard model um, that is heavier. Uh, it's, the only, it's the only fermion in the standard model that we know of that's heavier than the W. So it's the only one that will generate this kind of CP asymmetry. Obviously with neutrinos, uh, sterile neutrinos, we can make them as heavy as we like because we haven't observed them yet, but the top quark is the only one that we have observed. And these are, th there's all these other parameters, psi, eta, and so forth. These are just written here for simplicity, but I've just um, con sort of kind of contracted them for simplicity. So this is just a recap slide. So in order to get the CP asymmetry in the top quark decay, uh, it's a Dirac particle, so we have to revisit those um, CP asymmetries that we looked at before, these formulas. Uh, and they are the same as we saw for the neutrinos, but for the Dirac case. The only difference here is that the Yaxgog like invariants, which have the um, mixing matrices, ma matrix contributions and phases, they're going to be from the CKM matrix rather than the lepton mix mixing matrix. And these Fs, which are corresponding to the loop functions, they're going to be for the, the cases that we just showed earlier. But apart from that, it's the same sort of formalism, same sort of technology that we apply. And when I did this, I got the following. So we can see the decay channels here. Um, so the branching ratios, I looked at U gamma, C gamma, U G and C G in final states. Now, U gamma is extremely tiny, uh, 10 to the minus 16. C gamma is slightly larger, 10 to the minus 14. This is just because the VCB is much larger than VUB from the CKM matrix. And over here we have UG, um, which is a little bit larger because you have a vertex, a strong coupling vertex, which is obviously much larger than the, uh, the um, QED vertex. Uh, and the CG is also roughly the same amount larger, 100 times larger, because of the um, VCB large, being larger than the VUB. So the, the most observable of these would be this last channel here, 10 to the minus 12. These are extremely small CP symmetries, but the one of interest is delta CP minus. Um, and they go from 10 to the minus three to 10 to the minus five. Um, and they're computed using those, um, using these delta CP minus basically from these uh, formulae. So the uncertainty here is just um, given from this, uh, the one sigma CKM angle uncertainties and propagating the, um, uh, the top quark, um, the, the, the running bottom quark mass at using the minimal subtraction scheme. Because obviously bottom quark is a QCD object. You have to run its mass. Uh, and there's uncertainties associated with that as well. So when you propagate those are the dominant uncertainties, you get the following. Yeah. So the results show that such radiative processes are obviously suppressed. Uh, we don't expect to see this decay at the current luminosity with the LHC. Uh, this is because the TTB, TT bar cross section is a little bit too small at the moment um, at 13 TV. But the, 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 the nice part about this is it's, a, it's an exact standard model prediction. So there are no free parameters beyond the standard model. So it's, it's a direct test of it. So as soon as you start, um, as soon as you have enough, enough uh, luminosity, you start probing um, this measurement. You expect it to be exactly what the prediction is. Otherwise, this, there's um, evidence of new physics. And the kinetic terms that we've derived the, and their imaginary parts, they have similar Lorentz structure, obviously, to BSM models. And BSM extensions via vector-like quarks, where you introduce vector-like quarks and you get flavor-changing neutral currents, or via two Higgs doublet models, these enhance the uh, top quark decay, these flavor changing decay um, processes by a lot. And in that case, you want you, you can directly use these loop functions for those contributions as well. And sometimes they get up to branching ratio of 10 to the minus five, and you would definitely see, uh, expect to see this soon. If, if you start cutting into this parameter space for at the LHC at current um, luminosity. Uh, and several of these models with 2HDM and with the vector like quarks, they provide better global fits than the standard model. So they have better chi-square than the standard model. So um, predicting these polarization observables is, is kind of interesting. So in conclusion, um, I've provided a, an overview of BSM neutrino models with uh, heavy right-handed singlets, provided a full one-loop calculation of the transition dipole moment, uh, explained how to generate a non-vanishing CP asymmetry, applied it to a seesaw model where we have uh, two right-handed neutrinos, N2 and N1, where N2 is larger than N1, computed the CP asymmetry for uh, N2 to N1 gamma, which is maximally around 10 to the minus three in our, in our uh, calculations, and also showed that the <clears throat> sterile neutrino decay CP asymmetry into active neutrinos is very small. Beyond that, we calculated the radiative flavor changing loop level top decays, T to C gamma, CG, UG, and U gamma, <clears throat> and provided the formulation for the CP asymmetry resulting from these loop functions, as well as um, an updated computation of the standard model branching fractions or predictions. These are obviously too small to be observed at the LHC at the current luminosity, 
However, um, the standard, this is a standard model prediction. So as soon as we, if we do have luminosity to start probing this parameter space, we will be able to test this, measure, uh, this prediction. And the new physics interactions, introducing new physics interactions via uh, some BSM models, like I said, via two Higgs doublet models or via vector-like quarks can enhance these channels a lot. So in that case, you can use the same formalism to compute this, the polarization observables or the CPS symmetries in the top decay in those BSM models. Uh, yeah, that was it. Thanks for listening to my talk. Thank you very much, Sean, for a very nice talk. So we have time for questions. Who wants to go first? Maybe I start. Can, can you go to page, slide uh, 37? Sure. Um, back to slide 37. Um, Oops. Yeah, 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 that was just yeah, this one here. Can you remind me, so it was a little bit too fast for me, delta CP plus and delta CP minus. What is delta CP plus? What is delta CP minus? So delta CP plus is the difference between the uh, top quark decaying into a positive polarization photon and a negative polarization photon, which is basically zero for our case. Uh, this is much larger. Uh, the decay into, there's a much larger difference between these two, which is the top decaying into a, a gamma minus and a top de T bar decaying into a gamma plus. So it's just um, ah, okay, okay. the definitions of the CPS symmetries that the community usually uses for these radiative decays. So where does it come from that, it, that the second one is much larger in, in uh, simple terms apart from the calculation? Uh, it, comes from, it comes from the, um, the, the, the CP phases and the way they sort of cancel or they increase basically between the two contributions. So it's, sorry, then it's in those factors of F if I look in your yes yeah or is it yeah it's it's in the factors of yeah it's in the factors of f that's right factors of f okay uh, but you also have the mass dependency right so that's what one the cp plus oh yes exactly exactly plus it has and the, so you have mu for example and then that will get suppressed yeah, yeah. of the quark yeah okay um any other questions I, I have uh, you know the question what are other observables which you can check uh, you know you're looking at these processes but are there any other observables you know and whether you check that that there are no constraints from there so um, do you mean for the neutrinos or for tops well the tops for example yeah yeah so I think um, there are no other constraints on this decay um, the, the, the trouble is just that the, the branching fraction is relatively low, so just producing them is the challenge. Um, as far as I'm aware, there are no other constraints on this pro like these kinds of processes occurring. Um, no, you, you, you are thinking in terms of uh, some effective operators, right, which generate those. Uh, it's not an effective operator. It's uh, directly from standard model weak interactions. So it's just like... Um, it's it's the full theory, UV complete theory. There's a, um, I think my my, my computer's frozen, but um, it, it it's from the charge current interactions, and they are complete. There's no there's no um, need for an EFT here. It's it's coming from these. So so for example, in the top, you have the top clock in the initial state, and then you have the down top clocks running in the loop. So there's no free parameters. Everything is fixed by the standard model in the case of the top. Well, so it's just a standard model process. Is that what you're saying? That's right, yeah. But it's a standard model process where, yeah, that's right, yeah, it's just a standard model process, but uh, it wasn't looked at. So the, the, making a prediction for the standard model process in the top quark case. That's right. So, so as a background there, you would have also the emission of two photons, right? If you have, would have a collinear photon, let, let's say you have a top going to a um, charm and then well, one photon, but you could also have another photon which goes along the direction of the jet. Um, and, and this, uh, how would, would that interfere with that? I, I'm just wondering kind of with the CP asymmetry, but, but uh, that, that's... But where, where's the other photon coming from? But you can radiate off a second photon from your, from your downtime box. 
Yeah, okay. But, but, but so I, is, I'm just thinking about experimentally how, how yeah, you... Yeah, yeah. Because, it's coming from, because the photon is coming from the top quark, um, you expect to see, and the photon, the jet is more or less massless compared to the top. You're going to see a photon with half the energy of the, the top, essentially. So, so you have one half photon, yeah, so it's basically... And another jet, a charged jet with the... Okay. Photon, yeah. So you just apply some cut, which will remove the... Um, uh, you just do a uh, just do an energy cut, momentum cut on the photon. Um, yeah. Now, let me ask you. You mentioned in the two Higgs doublet model of on slide thirty eight that you could get larger um, branching ratios or la larger branching ratios. Right, yeah. Than... yeah. Uh, Yes, that's right. Yes, you can. Do you have, uh, so you have to say quantitatively you could reach, so that's 10 to minus 5 for the branching ratio and then still the CP asymmetry will be. Yeah, so, yeah, so no one has actually computed the CP asymmetry because that's kind of the work that we're doing. Um, but we could just take those models and compute what the CP asymmetry would be for those predictions. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, the, in that case, there are, it is kind of narrow band because the, the two Higgs doublets, um, the reason it gets enhanced is because you have these charged Higgses running in the loop. And in order to get the CP symmetry, you need those charged Higgses to be larger than, to be lighter than the top masses. So there, I don't know, I don't think there's much parameter space available um, where that happens, but that's yeah. where you get that enhancement. Uh, okay, there will be, yeah, there will be strongly constrained. Yeah, they need to be lighter than the top. And because there are those searches of the top decaying into the charged Higgs. Exactly, exactly. Well, would, it, would it be possible also to have some extra CP violation in those models in principle? Yeah, yeah, there, there is because um, there's additional Higgs doublets, uh, they're pseudo they, they can be pseudoscalers. So you can introduce um, additional forms of uh, additional CP violation from there as well. Any other questions from Someone else? Um, let, let me ask you that there about the first thing. So, so with the, if you have sterile neutrinos or with that sterile neutrinos decaying into a photon and a neutrino, so how, how would you measure it? So you would have a telescope uh, Something yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, so the only way, like, I haven't thought about how we would do this much. Um, uh, I think it's quite hard. What, hap what you'd look for is, so the N2 to N1 gamma is a dominant decay channel for the sterile neutrinos. N1, uh, so there's no CP asymmetry, for example, for N1 to nu gamma, right? So you'd look for a line for N2 to N1, and you'd look for a separate line. And in that line, you'd ha if you could measure the polarization of the photons, you'd have you'd be able to um, constrain the CPU asymmetry, but then you'd have a separate line for N1 decaying into gamma, and there'd be no CP violation in that. So you have, it's kinematically closed between those two channels, basically, those two decay channels. One of them has CP asymmetry and one of them doesn't. So you'd have to do like a polarization measurement on the, on the larger line. And then you'd have to make an observation of the smaller line. Mm -hmm. But how you how you translate that back to them coming from neutrinos? That's uh, that's difficult because they could come from other processes in the same way. But that's um, yeah, that's uh, that's that's kind of a philosophical thing, almost. Yeah. So you could basically so if you see a line in the sky yeah. and, and you can measure the polarization, then you would that that would be one solution at least. Yes. Or, uh, unless you. There's another way to get a polarization. Correct, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I don't see other questions. So maybe let's thank Sham again. Uh, so yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks. Um, so